For exclusive podcasts and more, sign up at patreon.com slash partners in crime media. This week's Lawn Order Marathon winner is Kelly Hermance of Centerline, Michigan. Kelly will get a marathon decal showing she watched 26.2 hours of her favorite crime show. Be next week's winner, sign up at lawnorderpodcast.com. I'm Kevin Flynn with Rebecca Lavoie and Brady Carlson. And these are their stories. You think you know who did it, but you don't know who did it. Law and order, law and order, law and order. It's no ordinary police procedure, baby. It's the FNOG of police procedures, baby. Law and order, law and order, law and order, law and order. These are their stories, these are their stories. Welcome to These Are Their Stories, the podcast about Network TV's most enduring crime franchise and the real-life cases that inspired their shows. I'm Kevin Flynn. Each podcast will break down an episode from either Criminal Intent, SVU, or Original Recipe. And today we're looking at The Mothership, Law & Order, Season 7, Episode 19, Double Down. So he walks for killing a cop. But you nail him for killing the cop killer. An irony he gets to reflect upon over the next 40 years in Attica. Joining me to do just that is true crime author and the host of Crime Writers On and Netflix's You Can't Make This Up podcasts, Rebecca Lavoie. Hello, Rebecca. I almost peed myself when you invited me on the show, Kevin. Thank you. (laughs) I have no idea what that refers to. (laughs) And rounding out our panel is our very special guest, Tucker Carlson. (laughs) Oh, I'm sorry. It's Brady Carlson. Uh, I have now taken back my spot as the most powerful Carlson in media. That is fantastic. Congratulations. You deserve it, our benevolent overlord. I'm going to use it as wisely as I can. I'm probably not going to use it at all. I'm going to forget. And then someone's going to take it back from me. That's how it goes. The liberals would have you believe that the mothership is the superior law and order franchise. (laughs) We all know. It's criminal intent. (laughs) Or worse, trial by jury. (laughs) Oh, there we go. Uh, So, Brady, you have an observation about the new executive district attorney, Nolan Price, and that every case he tries, he ruins somebody's life. (laughs) Isn't that something? Now, uh, admittedly, I am not caught up with all of the new episodes, but in all of the ones that I've seen, he manages to screw somebody over Mm -hmm. huge every single time. (laughs) Yep. His Christmas card list has got to be very small. He's like the anti-Ben Stone. You know, I mean, like Ben Stone screwed up, but like he was always, what are we going to do to try and be right and moral and good? Mm -hmm. And this guy's like, if I leave 20 bodies in my wake at the end of the day, it's been a slow day. Yes, yes. My theory is... That Hugh Dancy is just so used to seeing his wife Claire Danes cry face mm-hmm. that he doesn't know how to go to work and not do that. So he's like, I need a script where I'm just going to be seeing cry faces all the time. I do think that Hugh Dancy delivers his lines an awful lot like Tucker Carlson does. <laughs> You're testifying because you feel guilty. You're trying to help Nicole get away with murder so you can feel better about yourself. <laughs> if, they, if you hear the cadence, well, it's there. He's just trying. And to think about <laughs> it is odd how he'll be he'll be giving a closing statement to the jury and he'll just cut away to show news clips from the mainstream media. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah never seen that on a law and order lawyer before. Uh, also, Brady, you discovered that between his stint on the mothership and on SVU that Dan Florek starred as Abraham Lincoln in the most racist sitcom in television history. Oh, my God. That show was terrifying and Uh, stunning at the same time yeah it was the show lasted like i think two episodes it was like on upn or paramount or one of those like by the way yeah no this is a legit thing that happened they were trying to come up with edgy comedies and they came up with what was the premise was like here's this black chief of staff to lincoln or he like works in the white house i think it was a british ambassador right and yeah yeah but yeah dan florick was lincoln what (laughs) Yeah. Shorty McForty Lincoln? Yeah. Yeah. They Bald? Put, <laughs> well, that's good because he put on like the, the mutton chops and all that other stuff, you know? Weird. Yeah. And it was like an unusually kind of like. He was like a horny Bill Clinton type of of uh, president. 
who's getting like dirty messages on the telegraph machine. This was happening and this show was produced in the 1990s. So it was basically supposed to be like, what if what if there was a Lewinsky style scandal in the Lincoln White House? What? Also, all these like terrible jokes that were supposed to be like ironic racism, but were actually just like really sketchy. What? Like it was. Yeah. Like. It was bonkers. 21 jump Lincoln. Yeah. Like, what the fuck? Well, Dan Flork got on the phone and he called Dick Wolf and said, pull me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now let's take a look at the first half of this episode. Law and Order season seven, episode 19, double down. Briscoe and Curtis investigate a fatal shootout in the street that happened after a liquor store robbery. They learned the victim was off duty cop Russell Schaefer who returned fire at the holdup man. Officer Schaefer was a 23-year veteran. He leaves a widow and four children. The cop shot reward program is automatically in effect. Veronica will screen the tips. Every nutcase in town who likes the sound of $10,000. The would-be getaway car the robbers left at the scene was stolen, and they were spotted getting into a livery town car. Driver Mitchell Titus hasn't been seen since passing that area. Profaci says cops at the Port Authority found a bloody shirt in the men's room with a bullet hole in the sleeve. The detectives nab Henry Harp, nursing a shotgun wound before he can get on a bus. He's found with $600 in his pocket and a request for a lawyer. After Van Buren bluffs that the ballistics link Harp to the fatal bullet, attorney Sally Bell tells Ross her client wants a deal. He'll tell the cops where to find Titus alive and well in exchange for only 10 years in prison or 15 years if Titus is dead. Lenny, Ray, Anita, and Jamie all wake up McCoy to get his thoughts. The cops suspect Titus is already dead and he shouldn't make the deal. But Jack worries what will happen if Titus is still out there. He gives the detectives until noon the next day to find the missing driver or he'll take Harp's deal. Harp's girlfriend says, around the time of the heist, he borrowed her hatchback, but insisted he return in 20 minutes, which he did. She also says that he's been hanging out with Earl Novak. Briscoe and Curtis find 9mm bullets at Novak's apartment, but no sign of him or Mr. Titus. With Mrs. Titus telling the press authorities won't make the deal to find her missing husband, Schiff orders McCoy to give Harp what he wants. Once Jack signs the agreement... The suspect says Titus is in an abandoned building on Avenue A. Lenny and Ray find Titus' body. The ME says it looks like he's been bludgeoned the day before, meaning that when McCoy made the deal, Harp already knew Titus was dead. Well, this could only happen in New York City. You're sitting in your getaway car, minding your own business, and a box truck double parks and boxes you in. Hey, move this thing down. He's parked in a loading zone. Move your damn truck. I'll park somewhere else. Right, in a minute. No, move it now. Move your truck. <laughs> the most New York line ever uttered on Law and Order. By the way, move your truck is like a joke that you say about New Yorkers when you don't know anything about New York. That is the most New York line that's ever been uttered. I was surprised that the entire episode wasn't an argument about moving the truck. I mean, they did that on Seinfeld. <laughs> they might as well do it on Law & Order, too. Yep. By the way, there's so many Amazon trucks these days, no one will ever rob a liquor store again. <laughs> the opening scene with the shoot 'em up thing, the most mm -hmm. old-fashioned crime that could happen in New York, A, why would anyone not think that was a cop who just randomly ran out and started shooting at everybody? Because it's New York. Yes. But like back then, people did not just randomly run out and start shooting at people. B. Says you. My favorite thing is a liquor store employee who comes up to the cops and says. Yeah, he got $1,200. He cleaned out the register. Was this the guy? I don't know who it was. I almost peed myself. I was so scared that I peed myself. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he volunteers this as, like, if, as if he does not smell like urine and have like a urine stain. <laughs> it's just like you know sometimes these witnesses come on and they sort of make themselves the hero after the fact and it's like oh well i you know i was gonna take him on but then the then he pulled the gun out like this guy is just like no i'm i'm just a, just a wimp right out of the gate there's the one guy who's like well, I would have helped, except I was looking over there. And then there was the other guy who was like, I was so scared that I beat myself. 
<laughs> and I'm like, and I live to tell I the could tale. Have thought of a single other thing to like give yourself an out there. It's yeah. like, no, I just I almost peed myself. Oh, I I, I, I spilled I mentioned, this. I almost peed myself. And out here is if I you spilled were... this nip of Jim Bean on my crotch. <laughs> I happened to be doing a tasting with some clientele yeah. at the time. I'm here as a viewer, and I'm like, listen, I know I'm only watching fiction, but I'm third hand embarrassed for all of you motherfuckers. <laughs> so embarrassed. So, by the way, in this episode, we get to see Profaci. Oh, Profaci. So, Profaci's got a lead on the getaway car. It belongs to Rodolfo Rodriguez. So, they kick in the door of his apartment, and they find him asleep in the middle of the day with his girlfriend. Good morning. Rise and shine. And keep your hands where I can see you. What's, what's this? What I do? You tell us, Rodolfo. Where were you at noon? Here with Sylvia. Why? What happened at noon? How tired are these two people that they can sleep through a bunch of cops kicking in the door and yelling at them? And he happens to be <laughs> someone who committed like a bunch of crimes before. Yeah. This poor fucking guy. Like the the bad luck. Like they look up the car and they're like, oh, he's been busted on like robberies and shit before. It's definitely him. It's not him. He's just a random dude who's gotten his car stolen for and he's wearing his underwear. On national television? He doesn't, yeah, he's he seems like he's in such hard times that he probably can't put on clothes. That, like, is his outfit for the day. And then he's like, well, at least I've got my car. Oh, wait. He's just like, where were you? Like, what's your alibi? Like, you know, he's, I've been... I was fucking her. Yeah. See we, her right there? Yeah, we had two minutes of intense lovemaking, and I fell asleep for 10 hours. After putting my underwear back on. Back I mean, that that does actually sound realistic <laughs> for a lot of people. <laughs> All right, so they get a clue at the Port Authority that this is the bus station in town. So they've discovered a bloody shirt in the bathroom along with the plastic wrap for a new dress shirt. Okay, it's blood. You sure it wasn't somebody with a nosebleed? Now look over there. Shirt, under the left armpit. Bullet hole. Plastic wrapper. Could have bought a new shirt at an arcade. To look pretty for his trip out of town. What cashier sells someone a new shirt when the one he's wearing is covered in blood? Have you ever been to New York, Kevin, or not? <laughs> <laughs> Literally anyone on the street would sell you anything, no matter what you looked like. But he comes up, like, bleeding from under his armpit. It's like, do you have this in a 16-inch collar? Who needs a shirt more than that guy? Yeah. <laughs> but I also have a pair of speakers, you know, he's buying, <laughs> buying it off the guy. Would you like a knockoff Louis Vuitton bag when you're here as well? <laughs> I'll take the shirt and the CB radio. I love that go. cop. Way to look out. You know, listen, I, you know me. I'm not always like Mr. Pro Cop on this show. That Port Authority cop was on it. The one in the bathroom. Yeah. He's like, you're looking for someone who may have been the victim of a shooting? First, I found these bloody paper towels in the sink. And then, thinking it might be something, I went and rooted around in this garbage can. <laughs> and, I, and I'm like, dude, I find bloody paper towels in the sink. And I'm like, is there a janitor? Here? I am not further investigating. I am not cleaning that up. No, but he's like doing his job in like a serious way. Yeah. It's very impressive. And contrast that to when they're looking around then after finding the shirt. They're like, well, the guy must be here somewhere in the Port Authority. And they look around for an interminable amount of time. And then Lenny goes, well, he's probably on a bus to who knows where. And he's literally standing next to the guy. <laughs> yeah. like the guy two seconds later, the guy falls over. Hey, Lenny, I think even you can catch him. Police, put your hands on him. Put him up. Even you could catch him, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's Lenny, Lenny could outrun that guy at that point. <laughs> We've seen so many scenes in so many of the shows where they go to a train station to look for someone. They go to a bus station to look for someone. They go to a place for someone. This scene is so funny. They think they have a guy for a second. And then like everybody at the bus station looks sketchy. <laughs> Somebody moves fast. That's so, him. What's so funny is they think they have a guy for a second. And then he just looks at them like, what the fuck? And they're like, oh, that must not be him. I'm pulling I'm out like, my ticket. Yeah. Well, he's got a ticket. Therefore, he's yes. innocent. Now I now know how to evade these crack cops, which is to look at them and be like, dude, it's not me. And they're like, yeah. oh, OK. Now I now know how to evade Logan and Curtis just to be like, no. And they're like, oh, no. OK. Amazing. Can I go back to the shirt for a second? Yes. Remember, this is the bus station. That guy's lucky. The only thing he's going to find is a T-shirt from Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> <laughs> You've never been to shitty stores like in cheap-ass New At York At the bus street. station, though? Literally anywhere. 
<laughs> it, w- it would have been hysterical if he had like dropped over and like you saw he was bleeding through his I love NY shirt. <laughs> All the way down. Oh, no. Yeah. no the, the red heart just keeps getting redder yeah. and redder. It looks like Carrie's prom date. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get to see somebody before they were famous. Before they were famous. Who is playing attorney Sally Bell? The last he saw him, he was alive. He'd seen the faces of Mr. Harp and his accomplice. They tied him up to give themselves time to get out of town. That's Carmela Soprano, Edie Falco. Correct. Best known as Carmela on The Sopranos and the lead in Nurse Jackie. Four-time Emmy winner, 18-time nominee, two Golden Globes and 11 Golden Globe nominations. This is her fourth Law & Order appearance as Sally Bell. Plus, she was the star of Brady's second favorite Law & Order series, Law and Order, True Crime. Mm. She's incredible <laughs> in this episode. Yeah, yeah. She oh, by the way, acts everyone. <laughs> by the way, she was also in Oz. Yeah. And who else was in Oz? Chris Maloney. And who else? Uh, J.K. Simmons. Yeah, who played? E.D. Falco is incredible in this episode. She outacts everybody by a lot. It's incredible. Well, she is the only one to go on to win four Emmy Awards and two Golden Globes. <laughs> Sorry, Benjamin Bratt. No offense. Yeah, but he got to like hang out with Julia Roberts for a while. So. Who also has an Academy Award. Okay. <laughs> by the way, you can currently see her in Avatar, The Way of the Water. Henry told me that, that she's like the big bad in Avatar. She's the general in that. Oh. Isn't she the one, though, that she was in it? Like, she filmed her scenes and then like eight years went by and then someone told her like hey did you hear about this new movie avatar and she's like wait i thought i thought that i just did some scenes for it and then they must have canceled it because i never heard back about it exactly she thought it had been like out so long ago and nobody talked to her about it because it was such a big bomb <laughs> i love her she's the best so Edie falco won two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for project als on who wants to be a millionaire good for her uh here was the question are you ready for her question sure the Broadway play Copenhagen is based on a historic meeting between Niels Bohr and what other physicist? Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, and Enrico Fermi. She also used another one of her lifelines. She polled the audience. Uh huh. And 41% said Einstein, 56% said. Heisenberg, and another 3% said Enrico Fermi, even though he was already off the board. (laughs) All right, does anybody have a guess? By the way, would you like to phone a friend? (laughs) 56% does not, 56% for Heisenberg does not sound like uncertainty to me. Yeah. You see what I did there? Yeah. I love science jokes. Yeah. What, What was the answer? Okay. Well, you gotta, you gotta, come on, you gotta, you gotta make a guess. It's too much, a lot of fucking pressure. Come on, what's your what final answer? What was the year? Uh, this was like 2004 or no, something. No, it was like the that? year of the meeting. <laughs> oh, I don't know. You don't get that kind of, We just didn't give that kind of information. Oh, God, I don't know. Uh, Einstein. Is that your final answer? No, Heisenberg. Is that your final answer? No. What was the answer? <laughs> She's going with Enrico Fermi. Enrico Fermi. <laughs> uh, it is uh, Werner Heisenberg. Just won 250 <laughs> Okay, Werner. It's Werner. Werner Heisenberg. Yes, I would like to see the particles. <laughs> oh, wait, wrong, wrong Werner. Wrong Werner. So that was the one that she won two hundred fifty thousand dollars on. She did get asked the half million dollar question. Yes, and then backed out. Are you ready for that question? I'm a hundred percent ready for that question. Okay. After being ordained by the Catholic Church, what composer became known as the Red Priest? Richard Wagner. Giacchino Rossini, Johann Strauss, Antonio Vivaldi. The Red Priest? Yeah. Red Pri- it was probably Vivaldi. I mean, probably Wagner, because he was weird, right? He was like evil and weird. It's either uh, Rossini or Vivaldi. I'm going to go with Rossini because his name is Rossini and his name means red. Rossini is my final answer. And that all ties into the episode because Jamie Ross is yeah. in this one. Rossini, mm-hmm. my final answer. Locking it in. No, it was yes. Vivaldi, but you God. win 250 <laughs> You go down for that half million damn to win. Damn it, damn it. We do have a Hey, It's That Girl. Hey, it's that girl. Can you give me the name of the actress playing Ruth Titus? 
the wife of the kidnapped driver. No, but I loved her. It might be true. My husband might be alive, tied up somewhere, wondering why nobody's coming to help him. I, I can't give you her name, but I can tell you what she was in. All right, give it to me. She was like the housekeeper or nanny or whatever in Billy Madison. <laughs> yes. Who like had a thing for Adam Sandler the whole time. That is actually the late Teresa Merritt. She was also Mama in the 1970s ABC comedy, That's My Mama. Hmm. And she played Aunt M in The Wiz. Oh, it's embarrassing that I know more about the cast of Billy Madison than I do about the cast of The Wiz. I yeah. just want to state that right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it is said that the producers of the movie Ghost wanted her for the role of Oda Mae Brown. Instead of Whoopi Goldberg? Yeah, Patrick Swayze insisted on Whoopi Goldberg, so she was robbed of her own Academy Award. God damn it. God damn it. Life isn't fair. Uh, we have a Hey, It's That Guy. Hey, it's... That guy. Uh, can you tell me who's playing Rodolfo Rodriguez, the guy whose car was stolen and whose Fruit of the Looms we all got to see? <laughs> his cornucopia? Yeah, his cornucopia. <laughs> oh, damn it, man. My car was parked right there. You're saying it was stolen? It's not there. Of course it was stolen. Why? Did you find it? That guy's name is Gary Perez. He's been in a bunch of procedurals like New York Undercover, Chicago PD, Third Watch, Blue Bloods, and The Closer. By the way, you know that he is a good actor because in 2013, he was nominated for the Joseph Jefferson Award for his supporting role in the play, The Motherfucker with the Hat. Oh, that sounds like an A-list play. <laughs> is that like a hip hop biopic about the band Men Without Hats? <laughs> I don't know, but it is a playbill to collect, I mm. think. Yeah. <laughs> Can you name the actor playing the little kid Ricky? Who's the little kid, Ricky? The one in Little League. <laughs> That's Harp's son. Ricky, go back to bed. But it's morning. Did I ask you what time it was? I don't know who that kid is, but the eye roll he gives when his mom snaps at him for walking into the kitchen at the wrong time <laughs> is epic. I know. Yeah. I, I mean, love that, that is mom. like he That is literally the only thing he does other than saying, but it's morning. <laughs> and he just owns that scene. Yeah, she's amazing. You can tell he was going on, going on to bigger things. His name is Christopher Rodriguez Marquette. Uh, he played Chris Lucado for five episodes in HBO's Barry. If you watch Barry, you're going to remember he's the innocent guy that Barry kills in the pivotal car scene. So if you're a big fan, that's where you know him from. You guys didn't recognize him from that? Nope. Surprised that you didn't. I thought he was an easy one. Um, <laughs> Shut up. He was nominated in the 2006 MTV Movie Awards for Best Kiss with Anna Faris in Just Friends. Okay. So the woman who plays the girlfriend is the mom of the main character in Knives Out. <gasps> oh. Martha's mom. He has a key. He wanted to know where I had parked it. I work for a catering service. I had to be at some lady's house in Westchester by four. He swore he'd have it back in 20 minutes. Oh, wow. You know what? It's so funny because she really was a standout for me in this show. She was like one of those, like, she came on like a newsie, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I Your know it's like, swinging. I know this is an audio medium, medium, but you know how like sometimes when a character comes on like a small part on Law and Order and they just sort of like take it over for a couple <laughs> of minutes with yep. both like their line delivery and their physical presence and their chapeau. She was that actor yeah. on this show, 100%. There's always those those people, they're, they're kind of rare, but they have like they're a witness or they're they're in relation to the larger investigation. But you kind of forget about the whole clock is ticking. We need to find this body thing for a moment. You're just like, well, how is she going to get to her catering job yes. if they impound her car? Yes. And you're also I have so many questions like, why is she with Henry? How did they meet? What is their backstory? What is going on there? Did you take your Ritalin today? <laughs> Why is my son getting out of bed and coming to breakfast when I told him it was morning? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so did you recognize number six in the lineup? No. All I knew is that having number five sit down, even though it was just a voice lineup, didn't seem fair. Number six, that is Alan Rickman. Are you fucking no. kidding me? Alan Lewis Rickman. Go ahead, number six. Move your damn truck and I'll park somewhere else. 
Oh, different Alan Rickman. Yeah, he spells it A L L E N. That's not uh, Alan Rickman uh, from Die Hard and Snape. He's not Hans Gruber. Uh, if you're a fan of the marvelous Ms. Okay, Maisel. Okay, hit pause there. Yeah. Did you just refer to the great Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber and Snape? Yeah. Just checking. <laughs> Go move on. <laughs> if you're a fan of marvelous Mrs. Maisel, he played Red Skelton. So before Die Hard, he was able to go as just Alan Rickman in classic movie roles that he had in I Was a Teenage Zombie, Flesh Eating Mothers, and Shock, Shock, Shock. Oh. Uh, Then he had to use his full name, but when he uh, voiced the video game The Space Bar, uh, they mistakenly put him down as Alan Rickman. Then he was on the TV show Nikki, and he got away with Al Rickman. And then in Honestly Amelia, he was listed as Alan Lucy Rickman. They misspelled Lewis as L-E-W-S-I. Hmm. Oh, Lucy. Yeah, it sounds like Desi Arnaz trying to say his name. Okay, so it's two in the morning, and it's the first time in the show we get to see McCoy's apartment. <gasps> I know. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I'm not, sure, <laughs> I'm not sure if, all, if when all my work colleagues show up at 2 a.m. in my house, I'm going to be putting on khakis and a button-down dress shirt. 2 a.m. justice, not always conducive to wisdom. Jamie? I think the driver's probably dead. Probably. No, I was amazed. He has a grandfather clock? What the fuck with the cl- the grandfather clock, Brady? <laughs> he's, he's, you know, it's, it's probably one of those things that, like, someone gave to him at some <laughs> point. I don't think of Jack McCoy as a guy who's, like, real concerned about the decor in his place. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you see the only, the only two things you see in his place are a desk with a bunch of papers all over mm-hmm. and this grandfather clock. And it, you just think like it would be kind of out of character if he had set up his whole Ikea bed frame. <laughs> if he wasn't just sleeping like on a mattress in the corner because he's going to be at work 18 hours a day anyway. Yeah, he definitely inherited that grandfather clock. Here are the things I saw. Yeah, that's somebody else's clock. Yeah, I saw all the accoutrement. Of like fancy lawyer guy. I saw the green glass lamp on the desk, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. I saw the grandfather clock. I saw him to- tossing like wool jackets on like a, a chair, right? Yeah, yeah. It was like the only thing I didn't see was the giant shelf with all the law books. Yeah, you're looking for the motorcycle saddle bag too. Really. <laughs> and I'm just like, where's the woman to make this orderly? That's yeah. all I wanted to know. She's, also, she's six feet under but, now. You know, you know, she you, died at the end of the last You season. know what I got though? Which we, I got a sniff of money. A sniff of money. Which is like a thing we don't really get about McCoy. Mm-hmm. Like there's like a backstory there, which you, you kind of get, but don't get. Well, I think I found the clue to that because as far as like decorations, he has all these family portraits that appear to be uh, daguerreotypes of Civil War plantation owners. Or something. Or something. I mean, McCoy, he's not a Civil War plantation owner. I hate to break it to you, Kevin Flynn, but he was not owning a plant. He would, I feel like McCoy would be more related to like the people who set up like communes in Michigan. Yeah. Who yeah. Based, right. Like, yeah. We're going to eat nothing but like bran flour. Right. <laughs> exactly. And vinegar. Exactly. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know, the one thing we did not get to see is the tear stained votive candle shrine to Claire Kincaid at his bedside table. Yeah. True. So McCoy gives them less than 12 hours to find Titus or on their own, or he's going to make that deal. So they uh, suspect that Harp's unnamed accomplice is Earl Novak. So they go again with that SWAT team to another door. And uh, they start by swinging the battery ram, like back and forth. And you hear him going, one, (laughs) two. Good. One, two. And I like, do they talk about whether it's going to be one, two, three, bang, or (laughs) one, two, bang? (laughs) On your mark, get set, (laughs) do it. (laughs) Also, no, you did it at the wrong time. Earl, I told you not to do this. Is that a job you want in the swap team is to have to carry around the big battering ram? And it's like everybody else gets a gun and you're like first one through the door unarmed with a big giant log. That's Stop heavy. Or I'll swing this giant heavy thing at yeah. you. And he's like, why is it always on the fifth floor? This this giant metal log isn't going to swing itself. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so Harp's baby mama says that this cold-blooded killer who borrows her car 
often borrows the car to transport equipment for their kids' little league games. Yeah. And as a young umpire, I can tell you that completely tracks. Yeah. Why not? So the Emmy says that he knew Titus had been dead for over 24 hours because there were already maggots hatching in his mouth. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Giuliani. (laughs) All right, now let's take a look at the second half of this episode. Feeling they've been duped, Ross tells McCoy and Schiff the agreement with Harp is not enforceable. We were coerced. An agreement made with a gun to your head or Mitchell Titus's head is not enforceable. Well, coercion's the least of it. Titus was dead before Henry Harp started talking to us, and Henry Harp knew it. It's my call, not on you. I signed the agreement. Well, she's right, it's worthless. Despite the trouble it may mean for future plea deals, Schiff tells them to throw it out and charge him with murder. The judge says he'll hear arguments that afternoon about whether or not the state must stick to its signed agreement. Meanwhile, Briscoe and Curtis discover the liquor store employee used to hold up his cover to steal cash from the back room and then change his piss pants. (laughs) (laughs) He needed the money to buy clothes. Yeah. With the rest of the cash accounted for, it means that Novak never got his cut of the robbery. Searching near Harp's son's Little League field, the police find Novak's body. At the hearing, Harp admits to killing the cop and the kidnapped victim to claim it was all part of the same crime. The judge gives McCoy a choice. Keep the original deal or scrap it and lose Harp's incriminating statements. That's when the detectives enter the courtroom and Ray whispers to Jack that they found Novak's body. But he insists the cops do not tell him anything else. McCoy takes the deal of 15 years for the cop killer in order to preserve his statements and prosecute him for Novak's murder. Bell moves to dismiss the new charges, saying Novak's killing was covered as part of the plea deal. McCoy argues because he didn't know Novak was murdered when he accepted the deal, it's not. But this is Jack fucking McCoy, so of course he knew. He tells Lenny and Ray they'll need to testify that they only told him Novak was dead, not that he was murdered. Curtis says he won't perjure himself, but Lenny fucking Briscoe says, yeah, I'll do that. Bell Cross, by the way, apologies to Brady's kids. Bell, <laughs> Bell Cross examines both McCoy and Briscoe, incredulous that he told the prosecutor Novak was dead, but not that he was murdered. She calls in Boy Scout Ray fucking Curtis to ask what really <laughs> happened, but he backs their story, testifying that prosecutors are stupid. The judge finds for the state, and McCoy seeks hard time for Harp. All right, by the way, our previous guest show writer, Ed Zuckerman, won the 1998 Edgar Allan Poe Award from the Mystery Writers of America for Best Television Episode for Double Down. Really? Yes, he did. Yay, Ed Zuckerman. Good for you. Uh, Schiff and Ross are like, fuck this deal. It's not enforceable now. But McCoy is worried that going back on his word will look bad in the future. But shouldn't we think about what happens the next time somebody's got a hostage and wants to make a deal with a DA? They might not think there's any point. You're worried about your reputation among criminals? And Ross says, you're worried about your reputation among criminals? Exactly. I know you should be worried about your reputation with the Constitution. Or attorneys represent criminals. Yeah. There are a couple there are a couple of moments in the second half of this where it's sort of like, you know, in the third Star Wars sequel where they basically like undo everything that happened in the second Star Wars. See, like they just say, sort of say like everything in the last Jedi didn't mean anything. Yeah. Right. So, you know, they, they, they like spend the whole first half of the episode. Like, should we make this deal? Should we not? And then the commercial break comes and Jamie goes, well, obviously we don't have to honor this deal. <laughs> right. So a lot of the pressure here about whether to take the deal or not is coming from Mrs. Titus, because, mm-hmm. you know, as far as she knows, like the, she says, the police officer who got killed, he's dead. Nobody can help him. My husband might still be alive. Somebody really ought to try and help him. So she turns to Ross and McCoy. Mrs. Titus, we understand how hard this is for you. What if it were your husband or your wife? What are you people here for? And I'm thinking Jamie's husband was like a sl- like the big bad the of, of an entire season. He was awful. McCoy... I mean, we know what his sort of issues with significant others are. That goes like like the worst possible question you could ask of those two characters. It would be like turning to Mariska and being like, what if this were your dad? 
<laughs> like the worst, the worst examples in the world. Correct. <laughs> she had just happened to ask the questions of the worst people. In the world. So they need the evidence to get. You're looking for other evidence to you know to try harp on and and, and connect them to the high. So they do hold a lineup with a bunch of stand-ins, and then you pan, and then you find Harper sitting down in a wheelchair. Yes. I got to say that, you know, this was one of the things where they're listening with the shade clothes, so it really it doesn't matter, but Briscoe is like, we can still bring in other eyewitnesses for a real lineup. <laughs> they're like, okay, we need five other wheelchairs and a whole bunch of gauze. <laughs> yeah. And some wet pants. Briscoe, by the way... As much as I love, Lenny yeah, you put him in the lineup. He'd be like, "Happy to see you." Exactly. <laughs> Welcome to our police station. As much as I love Lenny Briscoe, as like I would have wanted him to be my uncle, worst <laughs> cop ever. Like, not maybe not the worst cop ever. I mean, like Sipowitz, whatever. All of his friends were the worst cops. Yeah. He was just like friends Legit. of the worst cops. Like, like his willingness to lie on the stand reflexively. His yeah. willingness to cheat a lineup reflects him. I cannot believe I named my fucking dog after this guy. <laughs> so they visit Ricky's Little League field. It's a dumper's paradise. The river, the highway, the storage sheds. Detectives, over here. Then they find the body of Earl Novak hidden beneath a shopping cart mm. that anybody can see right through. Yes. <laughs> it's like, how are you hiding it? You can see right through the shopping cart. Because they figured that, you know, on the front of the cart, they always have those like ads for fruit or whatever. Yeah. They're like, people are going to get distracted by the savings and they'll miss the body underneath. <laughs> by the way, Rebecca, where they found that body, uh, ground rule double. <laughs> so they want to have their cake and eat it, too. So they try to convince the judge that when Curtis and Briscoe walked into that courtroom in front of everybody and told McCoy they found Novak dead that they didn't mention it was murder, and McCoy didn't know it was murder either. Yeah. Well, on examination, Bell asks, really, did you think he died of old age? What did you think, Mr. McCoy, that he had died of old age? I didn't know what he died of. Really? I mean, McCoy's saying, hey, it's New York. There's a thousand different ways he could die. Rat bite infection, City bike collision, 99 cent pizza slice, Kramer dropping an air conditioner out of the window, <laughs> Macy's Day balloon strangulation. Dying of torts law boredom. <laughs> Thanks, Giuliani. My favorite moment in, in that scene is where Sally is cross-examining McCoy and she goes, How many years have you been a prosecutor? 22. How many cases have you worked where criminals murdered their accomplices? And of course, he's trying to like play up like, I don't know how this guy died. And she's just like, he nods his head in this hilarious way. And he just goes, several, several. <laughs> it happens. I can't put like, a number on it. Somewhere between two and 10 trillion. It's a number greater than zero. <laughs> Who can say? Who can honestly say? But just because it happened to those several times doesn't mean it happened this time. <laughs> mm. This time it may have been. Ebola. I don't know. <laughs> well, Judgey McJudge face Ray Curtis is called to the stand. And you mean you Hottie McHotface? Yeah. Well, you think he's going to tell the truth and, you know, basically rat everybody out. But he does go along with the lie or at least the obfuscation. But he does get a zinger in on McCoy. Why didn't you tell him the most important thing, Detective Curtis? We might have thought it was understood. Understood. Because that is the logical inference for an experienced prosecutor to draw. For a detective, yes. For a prosecutor, I don't know. In my experience, sometimes they're not too bright. And they're ugly, too. Yes. I've seen his apartment. He's got this stupid <laughs> grandfather clock. Yes. You probably can't even tell what time it is anyway. By the way, we should see what, like, Curtis's apartment looks like. It's not that nice. It's just not. Not after his wife threw him out. Yeah. <laughs> one less egg to fry. <laughs> one less bell to answer. Uh, but in the end, the judge says, hmm, I really don't believe you, but what you going to do? Death penalty. What you going to do? <laughs> Two cops and a prosecutor. I mean, that's who we believe here in the criminal legal system. That's how it works. Right? I do wonder, though, whether this was the scene McCoy sort of 
nudging Curtis a little bit toward the dark side here. I think this is the scene that started to turn him from being this Mr. Straight Laced, I'm doing everything by the book, and started to sort of see, well, there are lots of ways to look at a situation. Some of the ones you think are evil are actually great. Yeah, I got to tell you, God's honest truth, uh, Benjamin Bratt now lives in a small town in western Massachusetts, the same one that my sister lives in. Yep. And apparently he's got a young son who's an athlete and is sort of in the same uh, age group as my nephew. And apparently Benjamin Bratt, the people just see him going around to the post office, picking up his mail. Nobody is asking him, though, to come on our podcast, which I'm very disappointed with the Same. people are. Yeah, That Same. seems like a missed opportunity. It was really a missed does. opportunity. It really does. He would have gotten the question about Vivaldi or Rossini or whoever Absolutely. that was. Yes. He could have been your phone or friend, but you guys fucking suck. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm very sure, Kevin, that he really needs us to boost his career as well. It was a great opportunity for him that he has shooed. I would have given him one of those T-shirts. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the real-life story that inspired this episode. It's time for Rip from the Headlines. You think you know who did it. You think you know who did it. But you don't know who did it. You don't know who did it. Rip from the Headlines. Plot points for this episode revolve around the landmark case of Brady versus Maryland. In 1958, John Leo Brady and his girlfriend's brother, Charles Boblett, needed a getaway car for a planned bank robbery. The 25-year-olds wanted to nick the Ford Fairline of an acquaintance, 53-year-old William Brooks. Brady insisted Brooks not be hurt. After ambushing him on the dirt road near his home, Boblett struck Brooks with the butt of his shotgun. While Brady contemplated their next move, Boblett strangled Brooks with his shirt. Shaken by the murder, the two called off the bank heist and drove towards Washington State. They got as far as Virginia before dumping the Ford and taking a bus back to Maryland. Brady then left for Cuba, hoping to join Castro's rebel fighters. While in Havana, he reasoned his only crime was the car theft and turned himself in thinking he got a light sentence. Meanwhile, Boblett told police Brady was the killer. The accomplices were tried separately. The jurors in both cases sentenced the men to the gas chamber. While on appeal, Brady learned Boblett admitted to killing Brooks alone, but prosecutors withheld that evidence. The Supreme Court ruled that Brady's due process rights had been violated. The ruling set the precedent that the state must turn over exculpatory evidence. John Brady received clemency from the governor in 1974 and was released from death row. He died in 2009, having never reoffended. So Sai says that uh, plot points were inspired by Brady versus Maryland. (laughs) Uh, But I can say that almost zero plot points were inspired by Brady versus Maryland. Uh Again... I'll say that the internet let me down. Oh. Uh, there's really nothing about this case where prosecutors withhold exculpatory evidence. Mm. However, McCoy does that shit all the time. He does. It's kind of his jam. He does. Uh, I guess that's what I get for trusting internet legal analysis from people who watch Law & Order. Yep. Yep. Again. Again. That story took a heck of a left turn. Wouldn't that have been something if all of a sudden Henry Harp is like, you know what? I was trying to take the bus from the Port Authority to Cuba. <laughs> Yeah, join Castro. Yeah, then he says, you know what? I don't think I did anything really that bad. Nope. So why don't I just go back to America? By the way, I don't speak Spanish, so what the fuck am I doing here in Havana? I actually really did like the twist in this episode where they were like, so here's the thing. Um, My friend did all the worst of the crimes and killed the cop, and I did you guys a favor by also murdering him so I could get to my kid's baseball practice on time. <laughs> mm. Is that I, Does that fit under Brady violation stuff right no, there? No, but again, as an empire, that totally tracks. <laughs> um, well, I mean, I guess there, there is like sort of this only, the only connection really is that, you know, someone died in what might be considered a carjacking. No, that's not the only connection. It's what? lawyers acting shady. Oh, is the yeah. Connection. Okay, sure. There's that's that. the connection. It's prosecutors being shady. That's the connection. Uh, you heard, of course, that Brady versus Maryland, of course, it went to the Supreme Court. It probably didn't look good to Brady's lawyers. At first, because during arguments, Justice William O. Douglas spent the whole time 
writing letters and sealing envelopes. <laughs> like Susan from Seinfeld? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, um, they're just talking. That was know. one of the thousand ways that, that uh, Earl Novak might have died <laughs> yeah. other than getting killed by Harp. You know, he just, maybe he bought some really cheap envelopes. From China, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he was just writing the whole time. It's kind of like Clarence Thomas planning his next yacht trip during Dobbs versus Jackson. <laughs> but regardless, it was Doug Douglas, who wrote in the 7-2 decision, actually, this is interesting, neither side argued anything about exculpatory evidence being withheld. That wasn't the point of it at all. And, and that was the decision? And Brady actually lost this appeal. Maryland won this appeal. He ended up staying on death row until they, you know, the other Supreme Court decision overturning the death penalty. And that's, you know, where, where he won. But here, here's what happened. Douglas used the decision to push his own agenda. This isn't really part, he just kind of wrote this into the decision. One of the things he wrote is that society wins not only when the guilty are convicted, but when criminal trials are fair. Our system suffers when any accused is treated unfairly. An inscription on the walls of the Department of Justice states the proposition candidly. Quote, the United States wins its point whenever justice is done, its citizens in the court. So in practice, why is this not the case? Because this is America, as Donald Clover says, right? <laughs> is it because, Brady, like every prosecutor is just like Jack McCoy? Well, I was going to say, I bet that when someone was reading that opinion to Jack McCoy, you know, a couple of sentences in, he put his hand up and just said, don't tell me, don't tell I me. I don't want to know how it ends. Exactly. <laughs> I don't want to know plausible exactly. deniability. Yeah. McCoy is, and I mean, this was the big character change on the show when he became the lead executive assistant DA and Ben Stone left. Ben Stone was sort of like Justice Douglas, you know, how can we do right and use the law to do that, to achieve justice and, and do it the right way? And McCoy's like, no, man, I'm here to win. <laughs> My job is to prosecute. I'm a prosecute. Which is accurate, which is accurate. I mean, it's accurate to what the criminal justice system actually looks like today. Yeah. It's an adversarial system. Yep. There's a winner and there's a loser. You want to be the winner. And the W's are important to maintain for every prosecution's office. Yeah. Got to fly the W. By the way, this was the second most important battle of Brady versus Marilyn. Uh, the other was Brady Carlson versus Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> In a 5-4 decision, Brady beat Marilyn for best upskirt subway great video. Oh, wow. Congratulations. Yeah, he was actually taking the video, so it's kind of creepy. <laughs> That's going to do it for us. We want to thank our guest, Brady Carlson. Brady, where can our listeners follow you online? You can find me on my website, BradyCarlson.com, or on the podcast website, CoolWeirdAwesome.com, which I think just goes back to BradyCarlson.com. That's efficient. Rebecca Lavoie, how can our listeners follow you? You can follow me anywhere they'd like, but it's always at Reb Lavoie. And you can track me, I guess still for the time being, on Twitter, at Kevin P. Flynn. You can also tweet to us at Law & Order Pod or follow us on Instagram at These Are Their Stories Podcast. Our newsreader was Cy Freighter. Our theme music was composed and performed by Uncanny Valleys. Content assistance from Travis Roy. Lily Flynn handles promotions. All clips in this podcast were used in compliance with the U.S. Copyrights Act Fair Use Exemption for criticism and commentary. Go to lawandorderpodcast.com and sign up for our newsletter for a chance to be our next Law & Order Marathon winner. These Other Stories was recorded in the Treehouse Yoga Studio above the Mockingbird Cafe in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi Studio and is a production of Partners in Crime Media. Partners in Crime Media.